Chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you know exactly how powerful a podcast can be, whether it's for entertainment, personal growth, commute time, or your daily, uh, maybe weekly workout in the gym. Podcasts are the medium that millions of people use to get the content that they're looking for. And the question I get most often is, how do you create your podcast? If you haven't heard about Anchor, I'll tell you because a good friend told me. First of all, it's free. We always like to lead with the good stuff. The platform has all the tools you need to record and edit your podcast all from your phone, tablet, or laptop. Anchor then goes to work for you by distributing your podcast episodes for you so it's able to be heard on all the top platforms, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. Best of all, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's a one-stop shop to create your podcast and get your voice heard and your story told. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Representing East Oakland, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome back, guys. Another episode of the Hawk Vision Podcast. You know what it is. Wherever you're listening, however you're listening, as the saying goes, I know you could be anywhere in the world, but you're here to rock with us, and I could not appreciate it more. Make sure that you like, share, and subscribe the Hawk Vision Podcast across all of your social media platforms. We're looking to connect with visionaries just like you. Real quick, I told you we was going to grow this thing, so we got a quick update on the listener base. We are now 30 states deep, active listenership, and more importantly, 18 countries. So this is not a game. Um I'm excited about the guests we have today. Uh, this is someone I was recently made aware of, and, and the people told me you absolutely have to have her on the Hawk Vision podcast. They, they said, Chuck, listen, if you're talking about belief, vision, work ethic, all those things, you absolutely have to have her. She's the walking definition of a CE owner. Right. That has built her business from the ground up. No handouts, no trust fund. And she's operating in rarefied air as one of the top real estate brokers in the country. She's an author of the book uh, from broke to broker, a teacher. And most importantly, she's today's resource for greatness. Denise Williams, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm like, woo. you sound fancy. I love it. Thank That's you. so <laughs> Absolutely. You've earned every one of those accolades. We just had to package Thank it and make sure it was appropriate. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So we are going to jump so far right in to um, all of your success and some of the principles of it. Uh, I, I want to start off with asking, how does it feel to be recognized as one of the youngest Afri- African-Americans to serve as a CEO of a, of a real estate brokerage firm? It feels absolutely amazing. Um, just thinking about it sometimes just gives me chills because it's like, wow, how did I get here? You know, um, coming from where I come from, you just don't see these types of success stories. And uh, sometimes it's surreal because I'm so focused on doing yeah. that I don't always have time to look up and really like pat myself on the back. So even, uh, you know, I joke, but when you just made the introduction, it gave me chills because I'm just so grateful uh, and so humbled to be in this position um, and to be able to help others and show others that it's possible. Um, yeah, it's amazing. It feels great. I love it. I love it. And you know what I love the most about it is that with all the success, and I know it sounds cliche, but with all the success you have, all the certified results, right? It's still not something where you're like, uh, it was easy. It was, it's part of the game. I expected it, right? Like you're still yeah. lost in the work. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think people lose track of that. It's like, they look at the success at the end, but it's just like, but you really don't know what it took to get here. And it makes it a different kind of, and it gives you a different kind of energy when you come over that hump, right. you know, versus some people who may have been given the silver spoon or whatever. Um, it just makes it totally different when you have to really get it out the mud. Right. Right. And and it's different to have to build like if you if you want, we can dive into your background just a little bit like, um, oh, sure. you know, in, in terms of. Uh, being one of multiple children and having to start where money wasn't necessarily um, in abundance, <laughs> so to speak, right? right? And then going to, going to college. When did let, let's talk about that a little bit? When did you realize that you know if it was up to if it was going to be, it was up to you? Um, I realized that pretty 
think early on, um, when I was growing up, so I'm one of six children, I'm the fourth oldest. Okay. You know, we didn't have much. And so I tell people, you know, you can either decide to be a product of your environment or you can decide to change your environment. Mm. Um, I decided to change. You know, I was the first person in my family to go to college and graduate from university. Um, nice. So it's not always about what you see. It's just about what decisions you're going to make for your own personal life. Um, so for me, it was just no option other than to get out of where I was because I didn't want to continue in that type of path yeah. that my parents necessarily, you know, went through. Totally understand. I think sometimes we're hard on our parents, right? Because they, we, we, yeah. we heard that moniker: go to school, get a good education, and get a good yeah. job. And then we sit there, like, if you're conscious of it, you look at the results and be like, "But that didn't work." That didn't work. Yeah, that definitely didn't work. And so I had to go online to figure it out. <laughs> figure it out. You know, when I went through college, and you know, like you said, you're told to do that, and my parents did the best that they could. You know, there's no shade to them. Absolutely. At all. Um, you know, I'm a young parent as well, so I can understand how difficult, you know, it is, and especially to raise six children. Yes. Um, so for me, it was just like, okay, I went to college after I graduated from college, you know, I was looking to find a job. I had a really high GPA. I pledged in a sorority, you know, I did all this community service. You know, I felt like I checked all the boxes. Yes. Um, but what was missing is the fact that I still couldn't find security in the workforce. Um, mm. And so I was so shocked. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I did all this. I spent all this money. I'm in debt now. <laughs> <laughs> right. And now, you know, I can't even find a job that I feel like is, was worth the four years. And that's my five years for me. Um, I was a little fast for a little bit in college. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a little longer to get out of there, but I got out of there. <laughs> and that's, hey, listen, my, my daddy used to always say, you know what they called a doctor that graduated with a C? Doctor. Uh, doctor. They still, exactly. You know? Exactly. <laughs> 100%. So. And so when I realized that, you know, corporate America wasn't going to give me what I felt like I deserved, I had to take my success and my life into my own hands. And so in doing so, decided to look at other career ventures, landed on real estate, um, and, you know, just doing research. And if you think about it, literally every millionaire, every billionaire own real estate in some capacity. Yes. And so in doing research with that industry, I was like, okay, I'm unlimited income potential, number one. Right. I'm like, I get to be fly and cute while I do it. Like, it's a dress <laughs> code. Oh my God. Like, <laughs> Dream um, job. And was, yes. And if you can't tell already, like, I just love people. So, yeah. um, working with people, helping them to do something because prior to real estate, I worked for a company um, that was a title pond company. And in okay. that experience, I felt like I was really doing people a disservice. So it really just didn't sit well with my ethos. And so in that, I was just like, you know what, this can't be life. I want to be in an industry that I can actually help bring joy to people, take it away. I want to give, I don't want to take. And so I decided that real estate was going to be a really, really great fit for my personality, for my pockets, and for my parenting, because I had the flexibility to now focus on my son Versus being in corporate America, I was very, you know, had to obviously work on the schedule that they gave me. And when you're raising a child as a single parent, that can be very challenging. Listen, you you might have just gave the, the cheat code to success in careers all the way around. Parenting, <laughs> profits, and, and, and personality. What fits yes. all three? Listen, hold on. I'm, cop I'm trademarking that. Listen, take that. your time <laughs> and put that in. That is why we have these conversations. But, you yeah. know, so one of the things that that um, you're in an in ATL, correct? I am. Right. Mm -hmm. So I hear the market right there is like shark infested in term of competition, opportunity. Mm -hmm. What yeah. What is it that you were able to put together in terms of principles and practices that keeps you at the top of the food chain? Um. Well, for me. I think that ethics and customer service are going to take you so far. Wow. Um, and I think that people also need to realize that what you see on social media, it doesn't always translate to real life. Yes. Um, so, you know, there are people that may out market me. They may, you know, look better on social media. They may have more followers, but I do the work, you know, not that they don't. Right. But you want to just do your due diligence in general when you're dealing with anybody. But I feel like what sets me apart is my genuine heart for people. Um, genuinely wanting to help them and like all of my clients 
you know, I can say all, if I genuinely mean all of them are like family to me at this point. It's, I can literally call them, go to cookouts, go different things. And that has grown my business significantly. I yeah. tell people never focus on the money, always focus on the people, focus on your clients, make sure that they're good. And in return, the money is going to flow. Right. You know what I mean, the money is going to flow as the byproduct of your service. So I'm always service focused first. And that's been what set me apart in this industry. Especially you have to check yourself when you're in sales because a lot of sales people yeah. have commission breath. And that is one of the biggest turnoffs. You <laughs> might get that transaction. You know, you might get that check that one time. You might yes. get that hit. But you're not going to get that referral and repeat business. Did you call so it commission breath? Yeah. <laughs> is that what you just said? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> like that you, I'm sorry, guys. That one froze me out of my coffee for a second. I, I please feel free to keep going. That would just throw me off a little bit. I like it. Commission breath. Yes, you know when somebody's just trying to sell you something, says yes. you, but you don't feel like they're being genuine with you. You feel like they're only focused on their income and their pockets, yep. but not your well being. I mean, I've talked to people who have bought, you know, their second and third house, and were just like, you know, my first experience was blah 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 blah. You know, and, you know, I've just been in this industry a while. So yeah. I know what that looks like and how it makes people feel. I love it. I love it. In terms of studying the industry, and we'll get into some of the specifics, but in terms of if you look back on your career, what type of work did you have to do mentally, belief systems, work ethic in order to change your mindset towards money coming from where you came from? Whew, that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, <laughs> Changing my mindset really came from reading. Um, it also came from partnering myself with people who were like-minded individuals yeah. uh, that have a passion and desire to win. Uh, sometimes you have to make that tough decision and not keep everyone that you started with on the team. You know what I mean? Like that has been something that was a hard, hard lesson for me because I'm so passionate about just people and when I have to fire someone or let someone go or you know that's hard for me yeah. it's one of those things that you know it's not easy so I think surrounding yourself with the right people help your mindset one because it's going to help you to stay focused they're going to pour nothing but positivity into you um and then also my faith in God like just honestly praying to him fasting to him and just putting him first and just asking him for guidance um and not like this isn't my first brokerage, by the way. Right, so this right. This is my second, my second company, and so in that experience, you know, I realized that you, w I went through that for a reason. I went through that because I was disobedient to the path that he wanted me to be on. Mm. You know, I leaned to my own understanding, and that partnership failed. But guess what? I still ended up landing back where he wanted me to be. So you have to just continue to have faith in him, and he's gonna. You know, he won't steer you wrong. I love it. I love it. So why, what, what triggered to go from real estate agent to broker? What does that process look like? And why did you decide to, to make that shift for those yeah. that don't know what it is? Right, right. So as a real estate agent, you know, you go to school, you take a 75 hour free licensing course here in Georgia. Uh, you become a licensed agent. You have to be in the industry for three years in Georgia before you can sit for the broker exam. So you have to go through another round of school and another round of exams in order to become a broker. And obviously, you know, other things, experience, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so the reason I chose to become a real estate broker, well, I'll just take you back to the beginning. When I got licensed in 2012, I actually started with a large um, large real estate firm. Okay. The number one real estate firm in the country at the time. Um, and in that role, I actually was hired on as an agent services coordinator. So I worked as an employee for the company and as an agent. Um, so I took that position because obviously that's the best way to learn, you know, to learn directly from the team leader of the business. And so in that role, I was able to see how this company was run, their systems, their recruiting campaigns, their marketing uh, campaigns, different things like that. But the biggest thing that stood out for me, the eye-opening experience or the aha moment, was when I realized that this this uh, this company had closings every single day. It's an office of over 200 agents. Mm. And the agent's name would change. It would fluctuate every day, right? Because some, you know, you're not closing every single day. Correct. But Keller Williams was closing every single day. 
Listen. And so, you know, when I saw and realized that Keller Williams was on every single check that came through the door, no matter if it was two hundred dollars or two hundred thousand dollars, yes, Keller Williams was getting a piece of that. And so for me, I was like, wow, I've never met Gary Keller. Yeah, he's <laughs> money every single day. Yeah. I need to be in that position. Right. I need to leverage that. I want to be wherever he is on vacations, on yachts and doing these things and letting my business run itself. And so for me, I was on a mission to learn everything I needed to do or felt I could um, so that when it was time and when I was eligible to become a broker, I could go to school and do so. Um, and that was that's the biggest transition. So for people interested or people that are licensed agents, they might say, OK, well, should I become a broker or should I not? There's really no right or wrong way to do it because you're an independent contractor right. and you can make a lot of money as a real estate professional. Like Absolutely. You don't have to become a broker. Um, it, it really is two different roles. And honestly, a lot of salespeople aren't cut out to be brokers because right. it requires a different kind of mindset. It requires a different, different level of patience. And I think that agents, you know, a lot of top producing sales professionals, you might wonder, well, they've been in the business 10 years, 15 years, you've been in less time, but you made that choice. Well, they're sales driven. They're focused on, they don't have time to slow down. They don't right. have time to hold a new agent's hand and train them through a process or teach them how to write a contract. A lot of salespeople don't have the patience for that. Yeah. So, you know, and then the liability aspect of it, you know, every transaction that comes through the door, yes, I do get a percentage of it, but I also get the liability. Right. So guess who's getting those phone calls when there's an irate customer about something that happened? You know, you got to really think about the fact that we're dealing with one of the largest purchases people will ever make in their lives. Right. And so it's a very emotional process. And some people just don't want to deal with that. From the client side to the agent side, there's about nine people that touch every single file from the inspector to the appraiser to the. So every single person I'm responsible for in that transaction in order for it to get there successfully. You know, um, essentially as a broker. what's funny about that to me is that tons of salespeople, um, once you're a top producer, they cap out. Right. They get that million dollar producer yes. award, that five million dollar mm -hmm. producer award and they mm -hmm. cap out. But. What what you saw was the leverage that was available, yes. right? Why do yes. why do ten deals a month when you can have access to forty five? Exactly. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it because I, you know, it's it's it, the joy of doing this podcast for me is that you get to talk to people like yourself that understand the language of success, right? And yes. so when you mentioned uh, Gary Keller being on all of those checks, his business running on autopilot. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's important because people talk about their nine to fives, which I'm a fan of. I will never tell anyone to yes. quit your job, but we, yes. they talk about their nine to fives and then watch this. They talk about their network marketing company as a pyramid scheme. But what you mm -hmm. just mentioned, right, is that mm -hmm. Gary Keller was getting a check regardless who produced. Regardless. Right. You know, regardless, every single time. And so what you've done is you've decided, OK, it's all going to be a pyramid scheme. I'm just mm -hmm. uh, sorry. I won't say pyramid scheme, but it's all going to be a pyramid, but I'm going to be at the top of my own. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, listen, somebody's getting paid off of every single thing that we do. Anything that we buy, somebody is getting a piece of it. Right. So you can just just decide on which opportunity is going to work for you. But somebody's getting a piece of it. Anything that we purchase. What do you think is the biggest hurdle of putting a deal together right now? Is it credit? Is it down payment? Is it uh, education in terms of people knowing what they qualify for? Mm -hmm. What would you say is the, the biggest hurdle that you run into in your in your experience? I would say uh, from a client's perspective with dealing with clients, it's probably credit. Okay. Um, the reason I say that is because credit is something that people are individually responsible for. Yeah. Down payment assistance is something that the government can kick in and help you with. Right. Um, so, you know, unfortunately, a lot of people aren't educated on credit and they do things that obviously damage their credit. Yes. Um, and so that's just something that cannot be overcome. Like you have to hit a certain number in order to qualify. Right. Um, whereas with down payment assistance or, um, you know, with the financing side, there's more creative ways that we can use money to pull, you know, from the lender, from the agent, from the seller, from, you know, there's different pools of money that we can pull from to make a deal happen. But that credit, they're, they're very strict on that. 
So um, I would say that's the biggest hurdle. What about from your side, from, from your side of the desk, even overseeing the, the, the agents, mm-hmm. what would you say is the biggest hurdle on your end for putting a deal together? Um, the biggest side uh, or biggest issues I think that I face is uh, the psychology of the process. Mm. Um, people are very emotional in, in this process. They're wanting to make sure that they're getting the best deal. They want to make sure that their, you know, their agent isn't rushing them to pick a house because they're tired of showing them properties. You know, <laughs> they yes. want to make sure that they're not getting a scam. They want to make sure they're getting the best interest rate. So literally you're having conversations and holding someone's hand for a 30 to 45 days. So to keep them on, and that's, you know, after you actually found the property. So it can really be a 60, 90 day process. Yeah. Um, So you're literally having conversations with someone who can literally wake up one day and just say, you know what? Never mind. Forget it. Um, I don't want to purchase a home anymore. And you didn't get paid. So that 30 to 45 days, 90 days that you've spent with this client, you're no longer going to get a commission check. Right. And so that is the biggest piece of it all, keeping everyone on track and emotionally involved in the process. Yeah, I, I think it's it's hard. I remember the we built this house. We had this house built uh, from the mm-hmm. ground up and through the process. My wife is much better with um, processes than I am, right? Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. for me, I found, you know how they say, don't buy anything major while you're in the mm-hmm. process of buying a house. Well, I didn't buy anything oh, yeah. major, but I, un- I found out that my beverages and more, like my whiskey account, Mm-hmm. was going up a lot during the process of getting this house <laughs> built from the ground up. So I, I I understand it's an emotional process. It is an emotional process. It's just, it's yeah. so much. And, and not even, you know, even for people that qualify and can afford a house, it's still because yeah. it's something that, you know, speaking from the client side is because it's something that somebody else has the power to say yes or no on and you never meet yeah. them. You know what I mean? I think that's what it mm-hmm. is. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about your book just in in, in just this next segment. But I wanted to tell you this. I told my nine year old daughter that I was interviewing you today and because she's one of my biggest fans, daddy's girl. I have four, but my nine year old is, you know, it's like she loves daddy to death. Right. And while I'm trying to explain what you do, I said, well, baby, I think the easiest way to do it is she plays Monopoly in real life. And my (laughs) daughter lit up. When she's she's like, you can do that like, at, you know, because she we play Monopoly like every other night here because uh, I want them to understand money and property and all those things. And, and when I said she plays Monopoly in real life, she was like, wow, like she lit up. What does that feel like for you? <laughs> that, that, that's so, that makes me feel so special. Um, you said, what does that feel like? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that feels great. You know, I'm a big um, advocate for involving your children in this journey. Like, you know, you hear stories all the time. And even in my industry recently, just to give you a story, quick story. Sure. You know, um, I sold some land for a client. Um, I listed some land. It was about 33 acres of land. Okay. The grandmother had left this to her grandchildren. And they didn't want anything to do with it. Wow. They sold it. And so to me, that means that they weren't really vested or involved in the process. And, you know, you hear stories like that all the time. The children, like, you know, they leave, somebody passes away, the kids are left with it and they sell it instantly, immediately, because they're thinking about the quick check that they can get and what they can do to their house or what bags they can buy or whatever. Exactly. Yes. But for me, one of the things that I do with my son is I involve him in my process. I show him every commission check that I make. Love I bring it. him into my office. I make him record videos with me. I, I, you know, I'm making sure and molding him to understand that mommy is working this hard for you. But look, you can also reap the benefits if you work like mommy. Or, you know, look at what we've been able to, you know, you have to show them yes. the process in order for them to appreciate it. You Absolutely. have to give them some type of responsibility. I talk to Destin like he's my co-owner. I tell him that he, you are the co-owner of this business. So what would you say? How should I market this? What hashtag should I use? What, you know, he's, he'll be 12 tomorrow. God willing. Nice. So, happy so early birthday. I, I'm sorry. I said happy early birthday. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So I, um, 
he's at an age now, he's about to be 12, that I can actually get his opinion or get his input or, you know, what about this color or that color? So all the parents that may be listening, I highly encourage you to make your child a part of the process. Don't just leave a legacy that they don't understand. Mm. Make them understand what the legacy is all about and why it's so important for them to pick up the torch when you're gone. I love it. That's strong right there. Yeah. I, you know, I, someone that's hosting this podcast may or may not have watched P Valley. Right. And so uh, <laughs> the, the, I haven't seen it, but I heard it was good. Let's, I'm not going to say, yes, you should really watch it, but okay. yeah. So for the sake of conversation, there's a part in the show um, allegedly, right? Because I'm not gonna say I watched it. There's a <laughs> there's there's a part in the show allegedly where um, there's a family that owns some land, and two of the brothers want to sell the land. One brother mm-hmm. wants to lease the land, and okay. so that story that you just told me about, where uh, you know the, the the grandkids wanted to sell it and not understood the value of what leverage and longevity look like. That's what that made me think of. So yes, wanted to throw yes, that out there. Yes, yes understanding it completely and and you have to think about think about the grandmother think about all the years that it may have taken her to build that portfolio for them right in an instant i'm gone now you want to sell right with no google no no help no books no nothing like built it from literally from the mud yes wow yes so Mm -hmm. so let's talk about from broke to broker You, you you're an author now best selling Yes. <laughs> New York Times bestseller. Listen, I'm speaking that every day. That is my affirmation. It's coming. I over a million copies. I love yes. it. I love it. What what birthed the book? What made you want to uh, share that story? So when I started my business, um, just transparent moment, I was really scared of being the face of my business. Mm. I felt a little bit insecure because of my age, because of my experience, X, Y, and Z. You know, you have all these self-doubts. You yes. you know, you get in your own head a lot of times when you're about to make a big decision. And a lot of times that's because that's the decision you need to make and you need to tell fear bye-bye. Right. Um, but what I wanted to do was I never put something very personal out on a public stage. And people wanted to know how I was able to accomplish this. Like, I would get that question so, so much. Like, well, oh, wow, you really do that? Like, if I'm going or I'm somewhere at a a store, it literally just happened today. Okay. Um, I was in... um, in TJ Maxx and someone was we were just having I was having conversation with the cashier because I was buying this and some stuff we're going to Aruba tomorrow just needed some last minute things love it um and you know I look very young and you know I'm small and you know whatever the case may be and we were just <laughs> having a conversation and she's like well what do you do and I'm like well I own my own real estate brokerage and I get the exact same face every single time like people are just so shocked right and so I wanted to write a book to show people how I got here So instead of having to necessarily answer that question all the time, I'm like, listen, instead of me going through this long interview, I'm like, you know what? You should just read my book. Go to my website and here's my book. So I'm going to monetize on the question that I get every day. Listen, listen. Every single time. And when you hear something over and over and over again, I'm solving that problem. You want to know about me? You want to know how I did it? Here you go. Here is a book to to do that. And that's one part of it. That's That's my businesswoman side speaking. But the emotional side of me, wanted to write this book again because I never really released a lot of the things that I talked about in the book. Mm. A lot of times when you go through things, you suppress them. Yes. Um, You know, you go through them, but you don't want to rehash it or you don't want to think about it. And I literally cried the entire time I was writing this book. Um, And so it was a real, it was really therapeutic at Mm -hmm. the same time. I didn't expect that. Right. But it was actually very, very comforting to let things go because no matter how long ago something traumatic happened is going to always affect you if you don't let it go. Yeah. Um, and so although things that happened years ago, I, you know, I didn't realize it still affected me in the way that it did until I wrote this book. Somebody um, somewhere is is saying, well, tell me about those things. Tell me what happened. And we're going to tell you, you got to buy the book. Cause we only going to talk about a couple. <laughs> you got to <laughs> get the book. Yeah. We only going to talk about a couple of the things on there. Um, but, but go ahead and finish. I, I wanted to, I didn't want to interrupt that thought too much, but I wanted to make sure that they knew they weren't getting the book on this episode. They're going to get a piece of it. <laughs> no, no. Um, 
I think I, I, I forgot now, honestly. <laughs> That's hilarious. The So yeah. let's talk about the, the, the chapters that, I, or chapter five, which is, you know, the part that I love the most because it uh, obviously translates to the reason we do the podcast. You have mm-hmm. bullet points or topics in there. Dust yourself off and try again. No, it's not going to be easy. If you're going to do it, do it right. And mm-hmm. twas real love for real estate and marketing matters. Which one of those was your favorite to write? I know it's like making you choose one of your kids. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> what I would say is probably dust yourself off and try again. Um, reason being is because, like I mentioned, had failed partnerships, had a lot of different things go on uh, in my life, but you, that's just something that's just always going to be the case. Like it's yeah. something that's evergreen in everyone's life. You're going to have to dust yourself off and try again. There are going to be things that you're going to fail at, things that you're going to try and they're not going to work out. I can't tell you how much money I've spent in different business ventures that I thought would just be instant hits. I'm like, oh my gosh, I know when I've dropped this. <laughs> you're going to kill them. Everybody's about to buy it. Right. Everybody's going to, you know, until you <laughs> release something and then it's crickets, crickets. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah. And you just spend so much time and money and energy and effort into this, you know, this thing. Right. And some people, I think the difference between uh, success stories and people who just love to watch success stories on TV or on social media is that moment. It's that moment when you can pick your face up and you can try again. And you can just say, you know what, that didn't work out. Yeah. Let me keep pushing. Because embarrassment and ego are some things that people really allow to put years on top of things that they could have accomplished, you know, yes, you know, in a much shorter time, but they let their ego and the embarrassment of something that they failed at keep them back. You know, I had a mentor tell me one time, the only person that's keeping track, keeping track of your L's is you. Yes, exactly. And that it hit home so hard because I think for people that have an entre- entrepreneurial mindset or spirit, we get caught up in one it's our baby two we get so emotionally attached to it from the excitement that when it happens we feel like every we feel like it was a household name before Mm -hmm. it even launches because of how much time we've spent on it so then the failure is magnified because we know how much we loved it and wanted it to win and we feel like everybody should know and right. most people are like oh that didn't work okay cool i gotta go to work tomorrow so what we doing friday (laughs) right Mm -hmm. And they're over it. They're over it. And they're like, they're nobody is watching it. you fail. Like no. you, maybe your competition. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I've watched right. some people launch a podcast <laughs> and been like, yeah, okay. You don't love it. So I, I'll let you do your five episodes. Um, right. <laughs> you know, it, the, the, comp, the competitive part, no hate, no shade, yeah. the competitive mm-hmm. side, I'll say. Um, but when we have, when you have this baby that you want to give birth to in terms of projects like your book and launching your own company and then launching another company after one doesn't work well, what's the, what is that part that you can identify that keeps you focused on production? Like you get lost in the work. What, what's that part look like? Um, I think just focusing on the why, like the why you do what you do. So my why Destin is one of them. Um, you know, just making sure that he doesn't have an excuse yeah. to not be great. Like, you just don't have an excuse. Like, he already knows, like, just don't come to me with, with that. Come to me with a solution. Yes, that happened. Okay, fix it. How I love it. it. Um, so mentality and mindset are huge. Um, also going back to just the people that are in your life. So when my first company failed, um, I had agents on the team that really just, pushed me to keep going you know they believed in me um in moments like that you're gonna need something else to lean on yeah. you know I was I was ready to just be like well forget it I'll just make money being an agent like you know um but people around me were pushing me you know my mother trying to you know encouraging me to like look you can do it you've already done it you know I worked for a startup real estate brokerage uh, before starting my own company okay and so in that role I was really basically it was my baby you know, right. I was very new when I joined his his brokerage, so I was able to really do a lot um, and help him build it from the ground up. So I'd already had the experience that I needed to run my own business. But after, you know, just was discouraged in that moment. And right. I, I needed a pick-me-up. And, you know, my 
my tribe stepped in and helped me to change my mindset and, and try it again. So that's what I did. That's why people, your energy, protecting that and the people in your circle is so important. What does it look like to chase a dream and realize that you may be losing uh, friends and, and partnerships in the process? Sometimes it feels lonely, but you get over it. Um, <laughs> that's just my honest answer. Like, <laughs> She's like, yeah, I don't really care about the friends. No. <laughs> so it's, you know, I just feel like the people that are meant to be in my life are going to stick. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? They're going to stick like glue. They're going to understand like, yes, Denise hasn't called me in two, three months, but I know she head down. I know she's focused right now, but right. I still love her. Yes. And when she calls me, we're going to catch up and it's going to be like we back like we've never left. Because at the end of the day, I can't play around with y'all right now. Right. I'm not in a season to play. There was a season where, you know, I wanted to go out and there was a season where I wanted to, you know, vacation all the time and do different things. But I'm in a season right now that's going to require patience from the people that say they love me. And, um, you know, from my boyfriend to my son to, you know, because at the end of the day, you have to think about it from a time perspective let's look really look at time if you give me the next two three years to really just focus on building this business you have me for the rest of your life what is two or three years right. you know what i mean and if i can change our lives in that time frame then the people that love me will support that i love and it if they can't, then guess what you aren't you're not meant to be on what's going to be on the output side of this tell them Tell them, you know, <laughs> what's, what What I love about that is that most people don't understand the value of their time just in yeah. terms of even the TV shows that they watch or how they spend their days once they come home. And I know things are different right now due to COVID. And so we don't have that commute, come home, decompress, all that. But mm -hmm. there's still that that lost three to four hours every night that people forget to work on in terms of, you know, working on themselves or working on their goals or refining skill sets. What what have you learned in terms of processing that time? All right, just a bit of tech difficulty. Zoom is going to have some answers for me in a minute. But uh, Denise, we were talking about leveraging your time in terms of those three to four hours after work. And you mentioned that, you know, if you give me this amount of time now, you'll have me forever. Um, mm -hmm. When did you learn the value of time? Um, when I start being paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Just that simple. Can you hear me? Years when I actually started doing more like business consulting and things like that, because I was Mrs. Nice Girl, you know, um, I would always, you know, if somebody wanted to meet with me, I was doing whatever I could to make that happen. Um, and then now just because things are picking up so much, I have to really pick and choose where I put my time and energy. And I realized too, it took a couple times to get taken advantage of mm. um, as well to really understand that like people don't just want your time for no reason. You know, they want your time because they see value in you. Right. Um, if they didn't, they wouldn't be asking to meet up or to, you know, tell them this or help them out with that. You know, you get to help me out <laughs> request quite a bit. And if you don't learn how to monetize that or protect that, then you're going to continuously have to deal with it. And so once you start putting a price tag on it, those meetings and stuff, they slow down. I love it. I love it. <laughs> they you, slow down. <laughs> I think that's part of that. That's one of the things that I love about having conversations with, with genuine success stories and, and superstars like yourself is you understand your time. And I tell people all the, all the time when they ask me, Chuck, what kind of business would I, should I start? And I'm like, what do you spend your time doing that you enjoy that people ask you for help on? And that's yeah. where you find, you know, where your, where your niche can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, your passion isn't always going to be at the forefront always. Sometimes right. you just have to grind it out and do whatever is making you money first. Yeah. Make you some money and save it and then try to play around and figure out what your passion is. Absolutely. And that three to four hours after work, even though we don't have our commute, even though we don't have, you know, come home yes. and decompress, that could be time that you spend researching, you know, potential yes. venues. 
you know, um, one of the things that you guys can do is actually use Google Trends. Um, you know, use real raw data. Look yes. at numbers. You know, put in different words and phrases and see what people are talking about, what people are Googling, what people are thinking about. Um, because a lot of time, like, you know, I'm in the e-commerce space and in that space, it's not necessarily about what you like. It's about what other people like, right. what are other people trying to buy. Um, and so sometimes you have to just look at it that way um, while you shift through and, and find your purpose. Absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. If if you don't mind me asking, what's one thing that you've learned in business that you have leveraged in ter- into your relationship? Into my personal relationship with my boo thing? Yes, with, with the boo thing. <laughs> <laughs> what have I learned from business that has translated into that? Hmm. I would say I have grown to appreciate our quality time. Okay. Um, when we have it, because business can have you so tied up, so locked down. Um, and when you have so many other people pulling at you, they usually are the ones that have to take the back seat. Right. Um, so when we do have time together, you know, I'm learning to be more of just like, it's me and you, let me turn my phone off, you know, let me just shut business down for a moment and really appreciate the short amount of time we may be able to spend together today. You know, I, um, I love that. I love that. And I think that's why people should should shoot towards getting money out of the way, because yeah. most people can't turn the phone off and just yeah. enjoy. Right. But money yeah. provides that leverage for you. Exactly. And that was not always the case. You know what I mean? Like it was a it's an uphill battle. It's still an uphill battle. I'm still not making what I want to make because, you know, I have big, big goals. Yes. I don't think small. You know, so I think that it, it has been a struggle and he's been patient. And I'm grateful to have a partner that is also in the real estate industry and understands what's required. Yes. Um, because I don't know if it would work with someone that just didn't understand real estate, didn't understand my frustration. or didn't understand why it literally will take me until midnight to get this contract done. Right. You know, so I can appreciate the fact that he understands it. He speaks, we speak the same language. Um, so that makes the day a lot easier with regard to just telling him about the day and things like that. Um, and then his level of understanding is there. So it's been awesome. I love it. I love it. What does the word vision mean for you? Vision. Hmm. Vision for me just means consistency. That's the word that comes to my mind when I think about vision really realizing like what your full potential can be like who do you see yourself as yeah like who do you see yourself as like you know not who you necessarily are right now but who do you see yourself like what do you see yourself um and that took me a little while to really understand personally because i didn't know how great i was i would hear things all the time and i'm like what i did that i did that because like i said at the beginning of this focused on the work um so i had to really embrace like who I am and what do I see myself as and do I want more and like not just accept less than that. Um, so yeah, just being consistent and focused on where you want to go. Absolutely strong. What about the word belief? Um, belief, I believe has two parts. Okay. Uh, one part would be your belief in your faith, whoever, you know, whatever it is, that you believe in because, you know, some days that's just going to be all the only thing that can help you a hug from the boot thing ain't going to do it. A <laughs> prayer from my mama right then in that moment ain't going to like, you just have to have your one-on-one time with, with God. Yes. Um, and then the second part to the belief I feel like is personal belief in yourself, really understanding, like, I know that I can do this. It doesn't matter who doesn't believe me right now or believe in me right now. I know that this is going to happen. There are some outrageous visions that I have had and things that I do and, you know, and man, and I'm manifesting in my life, um, that people probably won't believe at this phase of where they see me in life. And that's okay because I believe it and right. I know that it's going to happen. I was just talking to my creative director, uh, uh, yesterday and I was just like, Oh my gosh, they listen, we're going to have this. We're going to do this. Our marketing budget is going to be this like, you know, and it's like, <laughs> 
it's big dreams, right? Right, goals, right. But I'm like, Zay, I know it's going to happen. And he's just right there with me. He's like, I know it. I know it. And, you know, we've been working together for like three years now. And he's like, one thing about you, Denise, is like, you've never gone backwards. Mm. Like, so I rock with you. Like, I'm here with you to the wheels fall off. Like, we're going to build this together. Um, and so shout out to you, Zay. <laughs> he is awesome. Absolutely. That's a, that's a big time compliment, though, for someone to believe in your in your vision for the company that you yes. run right that's yes. that's a big time compliment that's one of those you you got good energy <laughs> type of deals yes, you, yes. you vibrate I mean, high my brother. i love it i love it let me ask you this how how do you go about strengthening a belief system because like you said there are days when nothing helps right and so in the in the gap of your uh, religious beliefs or whatever those may be. And then your personal belief and your vision, what do you do to strengthen your belief? Like a friend of mine, I, I recently uh, spoke with her name is Himiko and she's like the, the West coast version of yourself. Um, she says she went to LA and she took her son to the Lamborghini and the Bentley dealership, not because she wanted one, but because he loves the cars. But while she was there, she realized that her vision wasn't big enough. Mm. Right. And so what type of what, what type of dream building do you do even at your stage? What type of dream building or uh, belief strengthening exercises do you do you do? Really just writing things out. OK, um, really, really writing it out. I have three whiteboards. in my room. I love it. Uh, three whiteboards in my room. Um, <laughs> so I'm really big on that kind of thing. Um, and just reiterating to yourself that it can happen like. I, what I like to do is I like to think back to certain stages in life that I was in okay. and like look at the now. It's like, okay, but I came through that, right? So right. you can get through the next thing. You can get through the next thing. Like it's not going to stop. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to sit there or are you going to just keep pushing? So, you know, um, Austin likes to say, you know, I've been through worse. That's like his favorite line. If he's having a bad day yeah. or if something is happening, it's just like, you know, I've been through worse. And when you can pinpoint like, yes, you literally have been through worse. Like just keep pushing forward. I love it. That's strong. I, I, that's similar to what I tell my daughters. I tell my daughters all pain is temporary. Right. Yes. And so I, I want them to be of the mindset. I tell them two things every day. All of my daughters, I either tell them be great or when they come to me with issues, I'm like, all pain is temporary. Let's work on this solution or let's yes. work on, you know, patching up the boo boo or whatever it is so right. that they can start focus on recovery and whatever that next thing is. Um, mm -hmm. So I like that thought process. And, and I heard the giggle when you said that you have three whiteboards in your room. I giggled, too, because most people <laughs> that sounds really, really we know how weird that sounds right to everybody else. <laughs> but it's, but for somebody that's solution oriented and driven um, mm -hmm. the way that you are in terms of and you're in a numbers based industry like that yeah. makes total sense. So I, I, I totally yeah. caught that. But um, <laughs> it, it makes sense. So I can see it like, you know, the, the 11 at night can't sleep and you just start yeah. writing. Just start writing. And then things change. Goals change. You know, you accomplish things. So you have to erase, you know, affirmations change. Just things change. Yeah. So that's why I like whiteboard. Um. I just love it. It's just I love it. Getting ready to wrap up. We got a couple of more questions left. Um, the next one being one of my absolute favorites, because uh, as we do this podcast, the goal is to help people shorten the learning curve, whether they're dream chasers, entrepreneurs and their relationships, whatever that may be. We want to make sure that everyone is, is shortening the learning curve when they listen. So when you have a new agent, uh, someone that says, you know what, Denise, I want to take on Atlanta. I want to sell homes. What do I need to know? What are the first couple of things that you that you make sure you give them as a broker? Um, when they're a brand new agent, they've never been in real estate um, before. Well, right now, I think the biggest way to market yourself is through online, being okay. on, having a strong online presence. Um, through social media, Google, all those outlets, getting reviews. So one of the things that I actually do is I incentivize, I incentivize my agents to get Google reviews. Nice. So they pay me less when they do something that I feel will benefit them. Um, so that's one of the things, just to show them the importance and seriousness of being 
online. Right. Um, you know, a lot of my business comes from social media. People want to do business with people that look like they're winning. So if you're, yes. if you don't have a social media presence, because now social media is the new website. Right. Nobody is really going to your website to look at things or to book with you or things like that. You're going to have to leverage. You just follow the way, follow the pattern of where things are going. Right. So, um, you know, I've already had pre-recorded, you know, marketing videos with them to show them how to run Facebook ads or show them how to set up their social media accounts. So if it's older agents or just relationships I've built with marketing agencies, you know, that can help support them in getting them to where they want to go. That's going to be the biggest way I feel like in 2020, because my firm is more of a millennial type based firm because okay. I'm young. So I tend to attract younger agents that get it, that want to be hip and out and things like that. Yes. So for us, that works, you know, for our clientele, even our, our client base is a lot of millennials as well. So that's what works for us as new agents that join this company. The other thing that you want to do is take advantage of the training. Okay. You want to learn your business. One of the things that I tell them in training all the time is don't be that agent that doesn't read their contracts. Ooh. Don't be, you know what I mean? You, you are, they are coming to you, yes, for a service, but they are trusting you to know and understand what that paper says. Right. Because what clients are going to do is they're going to just e-sign the document. When they, when you send it over, they're usually going to just sign it. Right. You know what I mean? Uh, well, unfortunately, a lot of people just don't read, but when an agent, you know, one of the best ways for them to learn is to, you know, <laughs> train by fire, as I like to say. Yes. So, you know, prior to COVID, I would have training classes where they would come in and I would literally have a red pen and draw through contracts or mark things wrong and grade their papers as if they were in grade school. Because to me, that's going to be the best way for you to remember. If I'm giving you examples and I'm showing you physically, no, this is the incorrect way or I'm striking things out or I'm somewhat embarrassing you because I'm, I'm telling you literally you just lost your client's earnest money. Wow. Like, you know, so we used to have really, really, really good, intense and intimate training sessions um, prior to COVID. So now I'm having to do that more so on Zoom. Um, but, you know, I think that training and marketing are going to be the biggest two because a lot of people, they, they can learn to sell, but if you don't know what you're doing, your posture is just going to be different. It's just not going to be right. You're not going to be confident. You know how to contract. Right. You're going to be less likely to pitch to someone that I'm a real estate professional if you don't even know how to write a contract on the property. So I like for them to come in, focus on the training and the marketing, and then everything else flows from there. I think you just said one of my favorite words and, and through all uh, 35, 40 episodes, I have not heard anyone say the word posture. That's how I know you were the sales industry. <laughs> That's how I know you are. Can you really quick before we wrap up, can you break down what a posture is in terms of sales or in terms of presenting public speaking, all of that? It's what you see when you book Denise the broker for an event. You know what I mean? Let's Look. go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Look, I'm walking in that room confident. And, you know, this isn't something that I've always had. Yes. It's something that you get from experience it's something that you get when you realize and understand your worth and your value um you know when you're inexperienced or you're coming at something because you're going to deal with clients especially in this industry it's either going to make or break you yes you know you're either going to be able to deal with these clients and their attitudes and their questions and their this and their that or you're not so you know my posture with clients is like i'm extremely professional and I can answer basically any question that they throw at me very quickly and very confidently. That's right. what's going to build that trust. And that's going to help you to get them through that process a lot smoother. But if you're an agent who's very timid or every time a client tells you, they telling you what to do, then it's going to be a lot harder for them to respect you as the professional. Yeah, you may get through it, but you're not going to necessarily have that level of respect as the professional. So I like to look at myself as the broker. There are other brokers, but I'm the broker. That's what so I'm talking about. When I go through, you know, it's just, that's your posture. You have to look at yourself as the best. You have to know that you're the best. Yeah. Even if there, there's always going to people going to be people out there that have sold more real estate than I have. Sure. There's always going to be people out there that might grow a larger brokerage than I have, but guess what? They're still not me. I and so it. that's the kind of attitude. That's what a posture is. Just believing in yourself a thousand percent. Absolutely agree. I had my mentor used to tell me that uh, poor posture costs you money. Like when you were little, your, your parents tell you, boy, you're going to hurt your back. You got bad posture. But when you're an adult, poor posture costs you money. 
Mm-hmm. So that that was that was I love that word. That's why I had to freeze on it real quick. Um, yes, yes. Last question, and and we'll let you we'll let you wrap up. I know you got you know deals to sign, money to make. Um, <laughs> but you mentioned Justin, your son. What does the word ownership mean to Denise Williams and her legacy? It means everything. Um, ownership, it, there is no higher title. Mm. <laughs> I mean, what 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 is there after that? You know right. what I mean? Like, ownership is key. It's so important. It's vital to your legacy. You can't say I'm leaving a legacy without some level of ownership in something. Um whether that's ownership and a life insurance policy. Look, don't even let me get on my rant about that. Because yes. In our community, it's so unfortunate. That is one of the keys to wealth. So many people like real estate because it sounds sexy right. and life insurance does not. But that's one of the ways that a lot of these cultures come up. Yeah, absolutely. You, if you look at Master P's story, you know, it has that settlement mm-hmm. and that life insurance. And that's what started mm-hmm. No Limit Records. See, that's awesome. I didn't even know that about um, Master P. But, you know, I think that that's that's great. Like just doing, owning different things, owning several things. So I've recently started investing in land because one of the things that I want to do is I want to start a farm. I want to have access to grow my own food if necessary because the world is acting crazy. You know, I want to have houses in different. Oh, what did you say? I said, yes, the world the world is very. Yes. Yes. It's going, <laughs> it's going crazy. So, you know, you need to be able to have somewhere that you can duck off. Or um, if you're just tired of the scenery, I love Atlanta. And I don't know if there's anywhere else I would rather live. But there are other places that I would like to live temporarily. I love um, it. So, you know, I'm just building out different avenues and places for us to go. And I I know one thing, Destin better not sell my land. Look, it's you say crazy. Justin better not sell. You coming? You coming back to get it? <laughs> so the, the land is instantly haunted. Uh huh. <laughs> yep. It's either ownership or be owned, and I completely believe in ownership. Mm, that's a strong one, um, ladies and gentlemen. You have been listening to author, business owner, real estate mogul, multi million dollar award winner. Denise Williams here on the Hog Vision Podcast. Denise, let everybody know where they can find you online. Yes, you can follow me on social media at Denise the Broker on all platforms. I am building my YouTube channel, so please go subscribe to Denise the Broker. I'm going to be driving. Awesome, awesome. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you have, uh, again, been sharing personal time that I hope has been beneficial to you with the Hog Vision Podcast. Guys, I, I want you to share across all of your platforms. And yes. uh, this is you're you're one of the greatest examples that I can, you know, personally, Denise, you're one of the greatest examples that I think I can have this podcast for to show to my daughters. So I, I want you to completely keep going. And and you mentioned that there's not many other places that you that you will live. I'm gonna put my bed in. California is ready for you. California. California is ready for come come through to the bay. You got a huge team. You got the rock star Erica Diaz, you know, down there with you. She she can she can speak on California for us. (laughs) We're gonna do so we're we're trying to put together a tour. So California would definitely be on the list. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, once a quick share across your multimedia platforms, all of your social media, um, across the board. It's the Hog Vision Podcast, guys. We will talk. Representing East Oakland, man.